Welcome to this conference organised by the International Migration Institute, The Changing Face of Global Mobility. Um, my name is Oliver Bakewell, the Director of the International Migration Institute. And until the summer, I was co-director alongside Hein de Haas, who is also here. And uh, he's since moved to Amsterdam to take up a chair in sociology there. But the two of us um, have worked together with our team in IMI, and to be honest, I, in the latter stages, I feel the team in IMI, particularly Ingrid and the crew, have uh, really done a fantastic job of bringing us all together, enabling us all to be here. Um, but we've been working together on this conference uh, before Hein left, and so it, it's, a jo it's a joint enterprise. And we wanted to start with a few words of introduction. And uh, our words are, are, need to be few, because we know from experience of organising such events, we must start the conference by keeping to time. So we set a good, good thing for the rest of, rest of the time. So I'll do my bit and then I'll pass over to Hein. Um, and so for a few personal reflections about uh, being, being at IMI, because it seems no time at all since Hein and I started work at this new thing, the International Migration Institute. And it's a bit strange to find a whole decade has passed and a bit sobering. <laughs> and, uh, yes, yeah, so as we mark this decade at the conference, we want to reflect a bit on how we started. <laughs> as interesting, I, I think that it's to some extent a myth of origin for IMI. I mean, it's told by our forefathers, and it is somewhat monogendered, I'm afraid, <laughs> um, with the plan for IMI being hatched in a pub in East Oxford. Um, it's not quite clear which pub it was. I had one story, Nick Van here had another. I asked Stephen yesterday, who was one of the people who met in that pub, and he said he couldn't remember. <laughs> so, it's um, a pub in East Oxford. There, Stephen Castles, who was then director of the Refugee Studies Centre, and Steve Vertevec, then director of Compass, Centre on Migration, Policy and Society, they got together and were inspired by the challenge of Dr. James Martin, who sadly passed away in 2013, whose benefaction set up the, what has become the Oxford Martin School. And he put the challenge of thinking about challenges and opportunities of facing humanity in the 21st century. Um, as entrepreneurial academics, Stephen and Steve uh, recognised that there was an opportunity there because there was, there was going to be some resources available, but also recognising that migration and mobility would continue to be major forces in human societies across the work globe um, in, in the coming century. They could make a case for having some new work on migration. I'm no doubt also inspired by the ale of the nameless pub. Uh, and they developed a proposal for a new research institute that would think forward to migration in the 21st century. And thankfully, their bid was successful, and IMI was launched as an institute of the Oxford Martin School. And we've continued to have considerable support from the school over the years, both in terms of funding, which has been you know, very important for us, but also outreach and communications, and indeed intellectual input, particularly from its director, Ian Golding who sadly couldn't be with us today and uh, has sent, you know, he's put a note in the, in the programme and has been incredibly supportive to us over the years. We've also been very fortunate that being part of the Oxford Martin School, we've also been based in the Department of International Development and that's provided a very solid intellectual and physical home for IMI. We've benefited enormously from the collaboration with our colleagues there and the support of the department over the years in many different ways. But what was missing in Oxford Migration Studies a decade ago that meant we need to have yet another centre? There was already a Refugee Studies Centre. There was already Compass. And we're still routinely asked to define the boundaries between the various research centres. And we never hide the fact they're blurred. There is our overlaps. But I want to point to what I think is three distinctive elements of IMI's work. And I know Hein will take up some of these um, in what he's got to say. And from the start, we have maintained an explicit focus on poorer regions of the world, whether it's seen as origin countries 
or looking at the relationship between migration and wider processes of development and change, or perhaps as Stephen might put it, social transformation. And this was clearly taken forward in our first geographical focus when we were very small, where we, we particularly looked at migration within, to and from Africa. In particular, we've looked at everyday processes of migration, challenging the dominant narrative that migration in such poor regions of the world is primarily about conflict, the flight of refugees, and or escaping poverty. So trying to bring a different perspective to, to analysis of migration in those regions of the world. Another aspect of our work which we, we uh, sort of think is distinctive is thinking about the, the future and at the same time, and also necessarily the past. As part of the Oxford Martin School, we were asked to analyse emerging patterns of migration. And we took this as an invitation to think about migration past and future. Where are the continuities and discontinuities in the patterns and trends we see? So challenging ideas about it's all, it's all different now, then what, is it so different from the past? It can be seen very clearly in our work on migration scenarios, where we've tried to think outside predictable trends, such as those of demography, and reflect on possible changes that upset our normality. For example, just in the lifetime of many of us in the room, but certainly not all, think of the fall of the Berlin Wall. This, um, which has dramatically changed the whole, the whole landscape, the politics, the, and certainly the patterns of migration, and thinking about migration. So what future possibilities are there for such changes? And we've been doing that in a project on migration scenarios. And also thinking about changing patterns we've seen in research on the uh, drivers and dynamics of migration, the DEMIC project, which Hein, I know, will, will say more about. So a third aspect of our work which um, we've tried to make distinct is a deep concern with theoretical questions challenging the concepts underlying many of the current debates about migration and mobility, challenging ideas of integration, thinking about deep questions about di ideas of diaspora, and so forth. So I've been particularly involved in the Themis project, which has critically examined the role of social networks in perpetuating migration systems. And I need to put a plug here for the new book, Beyond Networks, which is hot off the press from Polgrave. I saw the first copy last week. And you can see it on the Paul Graves stand where by, where by the um, registration desk. And that's a product of that Themis project. So it's really a very empirically orientated, very empirical project with looking at very quite profound theoretical questions. So there's those sort of academic uh, aspects to IMA. I think another thing I want to say for instance, is I think something we have strived to achieve, and I think I I think I'd be very happy to say we have achieved it, is a productive, very collegial form of working. Whether within the IMI team, with other colleagues in Oxford, or with other institutions. And this is something I personally have found incredibly stimulating. I came to IMI from a background working with NGOs. And uh, one of the attractions of the move was a chance to step back from working into log frames, to delivering to objectives set by others to have the space to think and pursue intriguing questions. And I've been able to, to do that whilst I've been, been here. But an unexpected bonus was finding myself part of this growing group of excellent researchers, first led by Stephen Castles, then Robin Cohen, and later Hein and me, which, contrary to many stereotypes of academics, did actually function as a team. Having this collegial working environment and also being able to extend that to many international collaborations has meant a great deal to me. So it's a great pleasure, personal pleasure, to welcome you today as friends and colleagues who join us both to mark the first decade of IMI and also join in the efforts to better understand migration and its implications for our common life together. So with that, I pass on the floor to Hein for his reflections on the journey that we started a decade ago. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Oliver. Uh, thanks all for coming. Uh, again, I would like to um, just confirm what Oliver said, how pleased we are to see so many people that we've been working with over the last uh, years, the last decade, we should say, 
and more people to that here. So I think it's an incredibly joyous uh, event this is going to be. It should be a celebration in my mind, but also uh, um, an opportunity to take stock of uh, not just what we've been done here at IMI, because we are not the center of the world, of course, uh, many other people in the world have tried to do to look at migration differently and also to study migration in different ways. And I think we very much feel part of that international research community. So indeed, together with Oliver, I joined IMI exactly 10 years ago to set up this new research institute under the leadership initially of Stephen and later Robin Cohen took uh, over directorship and later on both Ollie and I took over directorship <coughs> until I left Oliver to be the sole director uh, this summer. It's been an amazing journey and I would like to, it's often said, you know, it was a great collaboration, but this was something I hadn't expected and I'd never seen in my life. I was used to academic life being lots of academics sort of shut up in their offices doing their stuff, not even knowing what your neighbor were, was exactly doing at the university. And this was for me, a totally different experience. It was through collaboration, and I actually, through my eye and my experience, I've been starting to really believe in academic teamwork being the way to do research, and really the sum of the parts being much, of the, the whole being much bigger than the sum of the parts, uh, of the parts. And I think it's also largely due to Stephen to sort of create that spirit of collaboration within IMI. I remember the very first time that Stephen, for me, Stephen was, well, very important person, and, 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 and I've read your books, and then you come at this institute relatively early on in your career, a few days, a few years out of your PhD, and Stephen asking me to review a paper, whoops, of his, um, <laughs> and then asking comments, and I had this moment, I said, either I'm going to be honest, or I'm going to be afraid, and I said, I'd rather be honest to Stephen. And the way Stephen sort of then reacted to that very positively, because it was a gamble, because some senior academics would not react so positively if you would say what you really thought about something. And I thought it was a great paper. It's actually the first IMI working paper. But I gave some comments where I did not agree, and that was really appreciated. And that was not something I was necessarily used to. So, and I think, then we started to write this, this agenda paper, which I think is still on the website, which we uh, developed because we really wanted to think through what are we going to do here because we were aware there are so many migration institutes and so many researchers around the world. Just in Oxford we have two other institutes and across Europe and the world there's many more people working on migration. So what's really new, what can we really contribute in terms of renewing migration research? And there I think we were quite clear from the beginning that we wanted to shift away from what is still quite a Eurocentric or if you want to Euro-Atlantic centric vision of, of migration, the so-called receiving country bias, where by and large most migration research is focused on what migration means for wealthy countries where migrants go to, generally North America and Europe. The second aim was to really rethink migration or to contribute to a larger international effort to rethink <laughs> migration, to no longer just see migration as a problem to be tackled or a challenge to be managed, but rather to seriously conceive migration from a social scientific point of view as an intrinsic part of broader processes of development and social transformation and a potential resource to be harnessed. And in this first IMI paper called Towards a New Agenda for Migration Research, we laid out what we saw as the current, at that time, state of global migration research. And we tried to identify a few gaps. First of all, we saw there's a lack of research actually on migration processes. There is a lot on impacts of migration, particularly on destination countries. Uh, again, Europe, North America dominating very much the debate here. Much less on the impacts on origin countries and even less on the migration process itself. The nature of the process and the causes of the process. If you look also at the, the, the sort of uh, literature the reliance on policy categorizations of migrants and migrations, still reflecting a policy preoccupation and a quite big dominance of policy questions in terms of framing the whole migration issue. And a rather static approach to the analysis of migration systems and the focus, again, like Oliver said, on wealthier regions of the world. And more generally, a lack of theorization of migration. And we have tried in our efforts over the last decade to contribute so to such a shift in thinking about migration, to shift away from a Eurocentric focus or the so-called receiving country bias. 
to shift away from simplistic views which divide the world up in the so-called north and south, in which migrants massively move from the so-called south to the so-called north, and we know this is a simplification. <coughs> Whenever we read somewhere in a paper, more and more countries are countries of origin and destination, it's a historical aberration in a way, because countries have always been receiving and sending migrants over history, so we need to shift away from that. I think a few simple examples from research where we try to, a few examples of how we try to shift away from Eurocentric focus has, for instance, been the central, the Great Lakes project uh, where we, in, in, in Africa, where we have tried to look at normal migration. So people migrating for reasons quite similar to people re migrating in other regions, like for work or study or family, even in a region that is often known as a region of conflict and environmental issues, and in an international setting, often migration from Central Africa often being framed as it's all about conflict. We've actually tried to look at other forms of migration. When looking at migration policy, we've also looked at emigration policy, not just assuming that there is no migration policy in so-called origin countries, that many countries have tried to manage or stop or encourage the movement of their people outside of their national territory. Another example, again, from the research of Oliver, if we talk about integration, we automatically think, or assimilation or incorporation, we automatically think about North America and Europe. Again, Oliver has looked with his team to integration in African societies. African societies, to, to pick a few examples, Cote d'Ivoire, Gabon, and South Africa, are major destinations of, Africa, of migrants from within and even from outside Africa. They may deal with similar issues as uh, European or North American countries are doing. These are just a few examples. So we've done, tried to do this through a series of research projects, such as the Africa Migrations Program, the Determinants of International Migration Project, Imagining Europe from Outside Europe Program, the Global Migration Futures Program, Theorizing the Evolutions of Migration System, the so-called Themis Program, Drivers and Dynamics of High-Skilled International Migration, funded by the Sloan Foundation, and the Transatlantic Dialogues on Migration and Development, and the Great Lakes Projects. These are a few examples of key projects. Well, this has not been a, a single effort. We, in all those projects, we have collaborated with colleagues from around the world. In particular, we've tried to collaborate with people within regions uh, outside of Europe. And that effort has been quite successful. Uh, I mean, within a few years, we just started with three people initially. We grew out of a, to a center within five years, within the first five years of our existence, from three to more than 20 people. And in that process, we have also been able to generate quite some data, qualitative and quantitative databases, for instance, based on the Themis and EUMagine project, the DEMIC databases, this is a project I've been uh, coordinating, which has now given uh, rise to a few databases that gives unprecedented coverage of migration flows and migration policies. And actually, we will launch three of the four DEMIC databases today. And uh, if you're interested, later on in the afternoon coffee break, I will give a brief presentation on those databases and some of the first results analyzing those data. But those databases are now available from today on the website. The policy database, DEMIC policy, which tracks more than 6,500 policy changes by 45 countries around the world over the last century, a total migration flow database, and a bilateral migration flow database. We also have been working on a visa database, which is a bilateral database of a global panel of bilateral data on visa requirements of countries from around the world, uh, which will be released hopefully later this year. To give a few highlights of research insights, because we have very little time here, but a few research insights which came out of those collaborative projects, um, to give just a few examples. I mean, it's often assumed in debates that development leads to less migration. So often the response to so-called unwanted migration from the so-called global south to the so-called global north is we need more development. Actually, if you look closer at the data, we see a much more complex pattern. We are not the first to say this, but also if we look at data, we clearly see that often development or social transformation initially leads to more mobility instead of less mobility. Also looking at the data we have collected, again, we have seen that over the past half a century to a century, global migration has not accelerated. It's often talked of that migration has become much more prevalent. Actually, if we look at the data, we cannot really see such trends. It's rather a shift in directions and patterns, perhaps. But again, 
what we often think is not often true if we look at the data. Again, when we looked at migration policies, it's often assumed that policies have become more restrictive. Now, analyzing the migration policy database, we actually came to the conclusion that over the last half a century, most migration policies have become more liberal instead of more restrictive. This again challenges some of quite common assumptions, not just in the policy and public debate, but even within the academic sphere. And also from this African migration project, Again, in poor and conflict-ridden regions, many people still move for quite similar reasons, like work, study, family, as in wealthier and in more stable regions. These are just a few examples. I mean, I cannot go on a full lecture of what we've drawn out. And please, we have a great booklet, and Oliver is already shaking his head, so I won't do that, don't worry, Oli. Um, but I think these are just a few examples of reasons why indeed we need to rethink migration, we need to continue rethinking migration, continue to challenge our preconceptions of migration. And I think, and as I already said, this is not just an effort here at Oxford, I think there's more and more people around the world that try to think about migration in different ways, and this is why it's been such a great experience to work with so many people around the world. We've built many fruitful research collaborations with colleagues from around the world, not just in Europe, but also in Africa, and also in Asia and Latin America. So I think this effort, I hope to think, I, ho I wish to think, that the effort of rethinking migration is part of a global academic movement in which a new generation of migration researchers tries to think differently about migration. And for this conference, like I said, I hope this will be a celebration, but also a an opportunity to take stock of what we've been doing as an international migration research community, but also see what is missing. And to just mention one very important point, and I think continuing frustration, both of Oliver and me, is our wish to involve more researchers and students in our international community from a non-OECD background, to put it that way. And it's been an ongoing struggle an ongoing struggle even on the very practical level. We've been trying to get one of our main research collaborators from DRC Congo. He couldn't get a visa to get here to Oxford. I mean, these are very practical things we struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis. There is the whole issue of resources um, that, that, that still bias a lot of research towards this Eurocentric focus. So I think the world as it is, where the power is predominantly in the so-called global north, this will remain an ongoing struggle. And it is still the big academic centers in the so-called global north that are able to attract all the talent. And we see that amongst us. I mean, even IMI has been, I think, a pretty diverse institute. But it, it requires getting people to here in England to work at this institute. We have been trying to work with many colleagues in African countries to set up research collaborations, quite successfully so, but we've always been, also been witnessing their struggles to maintain their research strength and their funding base alive. And that's, I think, an ongoing struggle. Even though we would love to uh, redress this balance, it's a real struggle, uphill in many ways. And I think it's something we need to be conscious of when we work in the future that still, by and large, migration is an issue that is still framed in the debate, in research, from predominantly a Eurocentric perspective. Um, but, on a more positive note, again, we are very happy to have so many of our friends and academic soulmates reunited here in Oxford. And once again, it has been an amazing journey, the best of my professional life, and I think a very difficult to repeat once in a lifetime journey. And the best part for me has been the team spirit, the real collegial spirit, and the real willingness to work across barriers, disciplinary barriers, uh, personal barriers, and language barriers. I'm now a return migrant in Amsterdam, struggling to reintegrate in my <laughs> little society, very Hollando-centric society I'm discovering from day to day. It's not always easy, I can say. Am I a subject or object of research? I think I'm both these days. <laughs> I miss IMI a lot, um, the team spirit, but I'm very happy that a new project enabled me to plant a new IMI seed with a few other members of the IMI diaspora, as I now want to call it from now on. Because I think there is now a diaspora of IMI. <laughs> We've seen so many people coming and going out of IMI, and I think it creates some sort of a spirit. <laughs> 
Um, and I think I hope to think about it that way. And I hope this IMI seed, which I tried to plant abroad together with Simona, Katarina, and Carolyn, hope to flourish in the future and uh, create some more offshoots. And I hope to continue collaborating, not just with IMI folks, but also other fine colleagues I've been, have the opportunity of working with over the last decade. So I wish you a very fruitful and happy conference. And I would say up to the next years. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, it comes to me. This is still on, yeah. Uh, to do the housekeeping, the boring bits. Um, and uh, so, just one, before we move into the plenary session, which I'm going to sort of change hats and be chairing, um, a few a few modes of housekeeping. Firstly, as I said right at the beginning, one thing we've learnt in our years of organising conferences and workshops is things are much better if people keep to time. And we've asked the chairs of each session to be strict. And if you're presenting, please do respect the chair when you're called to time. And uh, it's always much better if you're presenting to actually, you get more from it if you listen to the questions and comments rather than hear yourself drone on. So do, <laughs> do keep to time. And we will be brutal and hopefully no one is going to get upset with that. Um, Outside the, plen this pl the plenary sessions, there, there will be two plenary, sorry, two parallel sessions. One will be in this lecture theatre, the other will be in the Suzuki uh, th lecture theatre, which is right by the where we where you re uh, went for registration. So we're moving between those two places. Please do allow time um, to move between them, especially if you're presenting. Um, I just there's a couple of other events. Uh, Heinz already mentioned that there will be the um, presentation of the Deming database this afternoon in the coffee break. So that's from 3.45 to 4.15. And so that will be a, a session in seminar room seven, which is by the stairs you went down on your way to registration. You looked, it's one of the rooms on the right there. Seminar room seven, it will be set up there. So you can go and take a look at that um, with your coffee. Um, tomorrow, uh, in the afternoon coffee break from 3.30 to 4, we'll also do it again from 6 to 6.30, we'll be showing the film which has been prepared as part of the African, sorry, the, um, great African Mobility in the Great Lakes um, project, which is a film prepared by our, our colleagues in in Uganda, the Refugee Law Project, um, which is part of that project. And so Nalawen Bebinaisa will, will give a very short introduction. It's about a 25-minute film. And so again, please do take a chance to look at it. It's the first time it's been shown in public. It's been a long time coming, so we're delighted to have got it here for the conference. Um, okay. Uh, all, all refreshments will be served in the Ruth Deitch building, which again is where the reception is, where the registration is, with the exception of the conference dinner, which will be in the college dining hall, which is halfway between the two as you pass it. Um, toilets you'll find in the lobby of both buildings, they're clearly marked, and likewise emergency exits and such like. Um, we have a fantastic team of people helping us keep organised. Um, I can't take much credit at all for the organisation. Um, you've all been in correspondence with Ingrid. Um, and if you need help with anything, she or one of the, her team, who you see in every room, you will see someone with a red lanyard, which shows that they're, they're one of the people, the volunteers, who's helping um, keep us organised. So they'll be able to direct you to any help you need. Um, I should also say... Um, we will be filming sessions in the conference, and they're likely to be going on the web. Um, be, so if you are very keen not to appear in anything, you might have to stay a bit quiet. Um, but if there's a particular concern for you, do please talk to Jenny um, Peebles, or, um, who will, is de dealing with this, and um, you know, we can fi find a way. We want to make sure everyone is heard, even if they don't want to be online. Um, or if there's things you say where it all goes horribly wrong, you know, maybe some editing can be done. Um, <laughs> unless you're actually a speaker, then you're stuck. Uh, okay. 
Finally, I should say just a couple of things. Um, this is, I think I would like to sort of particularly, Mark, we've got, you know, we've been, a lot of people have come. They're also friends and colleagues who haven't been able to come. And I'd particularly like to um, pass on apologies for absence from Steve Vertovec, who was one of the initiators of IMI with, with Stephen. And uh, unfortunately, isn't able to be with us today. I know he would have liked to be here, so um, just wanted to convey his apologies for that. And um, we, uh, yes, we've been very grateful for his support in getting us started and, uh, and over the years. And finally, I should also give a big, again, a thank you to the Oxford Martin School because, in a, part of their um, contribution to us has been actually to enable us to have the funding to be able to arrange this conference. So we're very grateful to, to them. And uh, they, yes, so we, we hope that yeah, this will be part of the outreach of the work for, for of the school. So thank you to them. Okay, so I think that I should stop there with the, um, uh, this opening session. Um, have I missed anything that I'm supposed to have said? Uh, no, okay. So, we'll move on now to the, ple the plenary session. Um, and uh, so I, I'll, I should introduce the speakers for that. And we have two speakers on this session um, where we've talked in terms of the sessions. The theme we put up was developing inequality and change. And both speakers are taking actually the starting point the events in, in, in Europe. So we start from that perspective and we will be able to broaden out from that. And we have two, two great speakers. One is Stephen Castles, who I'm sure is familiar. I think he knows many of you and I think nearly all of you will, will know his work. Um, and he's been a very important figure for IMI. We're delighted he's, he's come back um, from Australia to be here with us today. And... Um, so Stephen is research chair in sociology at the University of Sydney, and he, he's a sociologist and political economist. And then we also have Professor Tim, Timothy Hatton, Tim Hatton, who's at the University of Essex, but also um, at the Australian National University. So both of our speakers, they bridge the world. <laughs> um, they you know, move in between Australia and uh, the UK. Um, they couldn't be bridging it much more than that. And to, Tim's work has been focused on the, the cause and effects of international migration. He's, he's a sort of economic historian, I think. And uh, so he helps give a look at that long perspective on the data. Um, so they're going to give us, a, a, as I say, they're going to be taking the starting point of the events in Europe as a powerful reminder of the implications of continued global inequality, the need for, fun, and the need for fundamental change. And also... I think that we're raising the challenge of how we bring about that change. So first, Stephen is going to talk on the, on the global migration crisis. Do we need to rethink the relationship between development, inequality and change? And then Tim will be speaking on refugees and asylum seekers, the crisis in Europe and the future of policy. So both of them are asked to speak for 25 to 30 minutes. As the chair, I will try and be brutal and make sure they stick to that time. And then we have time, hopefully, about close to half an hour for questions at the end, questions and discussion. So, Stephen, the floor is yours. It's uh, an enormous pleasure to be here for this 10th anniversary conference and uh, to hear all the positive things that Ollie and Hein have said about the work we did together and about how the Institute's developed. Um, it's also great to be here and to see so many old friends and also many new faces um, who I hope will become friends in the, in the work we do together. Um, I won't say much about the uh, origins of IMI because, as uh, Ollie pointed out, time is very short. Um, it certainly has been very innovative and continues to be so, I think, uh, uh, so I can't put it all down to... Uh, my initial ideas, with, it's something that was really collective, as both Ollie and Hein have said. Um, the only thing, they left out one element of how the collectivity developed, and that was, I think, that there was a period when 
Um, IMI was housed with the Martin School in the old Indian Institute, and one of the administrators of um, the Martin School baked the most wonderful brownies and loved baking them. <laughs> and we used to have morning coffee every day together, and everyone talked about what they were doing, and I think that is a wonderful way of building a team, that people really have informal communication with each other quite uh, regularly. So, you know, people should not sit in their offices and hammer, hammer out stuff. They should be talking to each other. And I think IMI has, has built, built itself up that way. Um, you're probably all mu much more familiar with what's been happening in Europe than I am. I just, this is perhaps one illustrative photo of uh, asylum seekers in Budapest trying to get to Germany back in September when things were in the, in the media every day. Um, over a million people came to Western Europe, Western and, East, and Central Europe, really, um, in 2015, um, seeking asylum, most of them seeking asylum. The European Commission has uh, uh, forecast up to three million arrivals altogether uh, in 2015 and 2016. Now, this has been defined by some people as a refugee crisis, but it's also been pointed out that many people who come to Europe seeking asylum or seeking to live in Europe also have economic goals as well as protection goals, and it's very hard to distinguish between the two. Hence, there is also talk of a migration crisis as well as a refugee crisis. And I think that's very important to see the relationship between these two things. But I think one thing that is, is wrong in the way that it tends to be conceptualised in Europe is that it's seen as a fundamentally European issue. Um, I think the central question we should be throwing up is that... Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's more than just a migration crisis. It's really a political crisis of European, and I, I would add, of global governance. I don't really want to describe the crisis because you all know as much about it as I do, but we have to discuss how it affects our understanding of the relationship between poor and rich countries and the role played by mobility in, this, in these relationships. Does what is happening in Europe currently make it necessary to rethink the linkages between development, inequality, and change? So the central question I want to ask is what it says it on the slide there. Is the rapid growth of migration to Europe in 2015 merely a passing phenomenon or a new normal, not just for Europe, for the world as a whole? And of course, if it is, it makes it necessary to also think the political and economic relationships that lead to these, uh, these developments. Sealing borders and trying to stop migration will not solve anything. We need to address those deep-rooted issues. But as I said, it, it's not just a European issue. And there have been several so-called migration emergencies over the last few years. Um, I don't know if this ever got into the European press. It was certainly a big issue in Australia. Um, the Rohingya refugee crisis in, um, was about the middle of 2015. Very similar pictures to the European crisis. Um, in fact, you find migration crises emerging over the last few years in just about every region of the world, and particularly, of course, in Africa and Asia. Um, it really isn't particularly a European issue. And of course, most people affected by such crises remain in the regions. Um, I think something like 85% of the world's refugees are actually in poor countries. They don't ever end up in Germany or the USA or Australia, despite the perceptions in these countries. Um, here's another picture that, um, that typifies one of the, um, the migration crises of recent years. Between 2013 and 2015, 
this mass movement of unaccompanied children from Central America to the USA through Mexico. And this picture is taken on the, uh, the roof of the train, known as the Beast because it's so dangerous, that uh, goes from the south of Mexico through to, through to the north, and people try and get on that train by one way, way or another. Um, so clearly, we are not just talking about something that's affecting Europe. Um, there are refugee crises throughout the world. There are migration crises throughout the world. And um, it isn't an isolated phenomenon. So the, the European perception tends to be a little bit myopic. There's the idea this is really something that's happening in Europe, and Europe needs help from the rest of the world. It's actually a global problem that requires global solutions. Um, and, well, I'll talk about that more in a minute. So is there a fundamental difference between migration in search of protection and migration in search of a better livelihood? I would argue that the two are closely linked and that it's impossible to make clear distinctions in many cases. That's why UNHCR sometimes talks about mixed flows and tries to work out ways of unmixing them and categorizing people clearly. But it's a very difficult uh, thing to do. Um, one of the fundamental causes is, of course, inequality in the world. Um, and inequality is not just about absolute levels of poverty. It's about also pe how people understand what's happening. So the difference between um, income, different, income levels in poor countries and rich countries has increased. Now, that could mean at the same time that there's been an absolute increase in basic income in the poorer countries. But people see more the difference and the fact, the idea that if you could only move to another part of the world, you would be doing better. Um, Within countries, income differentials have increased. Um, this is connected very much with the, um, the, the, the structure of neoliberal globalization, which um, removes protections, removes protections for labor, uh, weakens welfare states, um, and, and really leads to a, a clustering of a few people at the top and a great majority at the bottom in, in income terms. Um, another thing that we saw very clearly in the crisis following 2008 is what's called financialization. These days, production of useful things is often less profitable um, than speculation in property, in um, uh, patents, and all sorts of things. So that um, there, there has been a stagnation in the actual level of, of production, um, while at the same time huge amounts of money circulate, and money is made, more money is made out of money. I won't go into detail about these aspects because they're pretty well known. We don't have time. Um, I would also argue that people usually don't seek to migrate just because of poverty, because poverty has been a factor in, in many countries for a very long time. They tend to try and migrate either because of perceptions of difference, but even more when their existing livelihoods become in, unviable. People are displaced. For instance, the Green Revolution, which increased agricultural productivity in many parts of the world and is seen as a very positive thing because of that. At the same time, often led to mass land flight because it required huge investments, of, or large investments of capital for tractors, fertilizers, irrigation, pesticides. And those could only be, be made by farmers with a, a fairly high level of income um, and uh, possession of reasonably large parcels of land. The poorer farmers, either smallholders or landless farmers, were pushed from the land and forced into the cities. 
But of course, in, in many of these growing southern cities, there is little work in the formal sector. There is a high level of informalization of employment, which means um, very poor incomes and living con working conditions. So a lot of this migration, in, of the migration we see in the world today is actually rural urban migration. <coughs> we don't have data on the number of internal migrants, but it's thought to be something like three or four times as big as that of international migration. Um, however, international, uh, rural urban migrants actually often migrate across national frontiers. If uh, you're in a country like China or India, rural urban migration is internal migration. If you live in a small country, um, moving to the city can often mean moving to another country. So again, we can't make a rigid distinction. Um, another issue which we talk about a lot is demographic, uh, <coughs> demographic growth in the poorer countries, which is seen by some as a problem, and demographic decline in the post-industrial economies. So again, that is a pull factor for migration. What we are actually seeing is the emergence of a global labor market, just as we have now global capital markets um, and global commodity markets. Um, we see that labor processes are divided across countries and capital tends to be invested in production in the areas where work can be done most cheaply. Um, this is best summed up in the notion of um, precarious employment. So in countries where labor legislation is weak and where certain groups of, uh, of workers are particularly vulnerable, um, there is a trend towards more and more informalization of employment. In turn, that, that process is re-imported into the highly developed countries. So we have more and more informalization of employment, even in previously privileged sectors. I don't know what it's like now in England, but in uh, Australia at the moment, something like half of all university lectures and seminars are delivered by um, people who have precarious employment situations, who have no continuity in employment. So even in our own field, we see this, this shift towards pre precarity. Um, outsourcing is another term that sums up what is happening. First, manufacturing industry was outsourced because it was possible to set up production areas in low-income countries. Then, white-collar jobs, routine office jobs, back office jobs like um, accounting and uh, managing um, utilities was outsourced, and now even research and development, which can be routinized, say software development, is being outsourced. So capital is in search of the cheapest way to do any form of work, and that leads to new hierarchies, or in some ways a resurrection of old hierarchies. Human capital, in other words, the productivity of someone who is highly educated, is meant to be the main um, the main reason for differentiation in reality, gender, race, ethnicity, and above all, legal status still play a major role. And legal status is, I think, particularly important because informal workers, workers uh, migrant workers who do not have um, documentation to migrate, can be very, are very vulnerable and can be easily exploited. So those are some of the, the factors leading to um, mobility and to hierarchization of labor. Um, but of course, what we usually talk about when we talk about the, the current flows is violence, 
conflict, denial of human rights, lack of human security. And as you know, at the moment we have the highest level of um, displacement of populations since the Second World War, uh, very high numbers of refugees, but even higher numbers of internally displaced people who are unable to cross borders and therefore lack even basic population. Half the population of Syria have now either been internally displaced or are seeking protection in other parts of the world. What links all these factors together is the new ways of, communica com of, of communicating. Um, the, uh, the use of modern forms of, of mass media and of social media are a powerful force leading to um, migration decisions or, or influencing migration decisions. So, um, because people in poorer areas see idealized media pictures of what life in the highly developed countries is like, for instance, through US TV, um, there is a belief in the possibilities of, of moving into that situation of prosperity. At the same time, um, migration networks are a powerful force for continuing migration. Um, past, past migration leads to more migration, and people follow well-trodden paths, as an Australian <coughs> economist once said, but they also become path-dependent in the sense that if early migration leads into less desirable forms of employment, people tend to get locked into that. It tends to become classified as migrant work. <clears throat> so often the media messages that impel or, or facilitate migration give quite misleading messages about the opportunities that are available. So to understand all this, we, we need to rethink the methodology of migration studies. We need to, um, we need to carry out a, a multi-scalar analysis. We need to look at the global forces that lead to social transformation and increased human mobility. Um, but we need to understand that these global forces are mediated through national and local histories and cultures. So it's very important when we look at migration not only to look at those macro-structural forces that impel movement, but also to look at the processes of mediation and the resistance of different population groups that develops at different levels and in different places. And here are just a few examples of some of the agency that has been developed uh, I won't go through it in detail because we're getting short of time. I'll leave that on that. Um, so, just to go back to the, the theme that was originally set for this, this part of the conference and perhaps has been a little bit overtaken. Um, at one time there was an optimistic view on the relationship between migration and development. There was an idea you know, the harris Todaro model that migration would lead to remittances and skills transfer to development, reduced inequality and then less migration. Um, this, was in, this was interesting. This view was developed in the 50s and 60s when developed countries had a very strong need for migrant labour. In the 70s, when that need for migrant labour was suddenly uh, seen as uh, less pressing or even damaging, the pessimistic view became dominant. Um, the, the view that migration actually has the opposite effect, that most migrants in any case come from middle income groups because you need resources to migrate, that remittances increase inequality on the whole, um, that migrants don't bring back skills or development, and in fact that uh, migration and development leads to more migration. Not to, not to less. Um, I think what we're beginning to see now is more a, a consensus emerging, the idea that migration alone 
does not support development, um, that you can't bring about development of a country just by increasing uh, migration. Uh, there needs to be a development-friendly climate, improvements in infrastructure, reduction of corruption, and so on. Um, and so it's development, um, it's development is, provides a way in which migration can be beneficial, but it doesn't automatically lead to it. Um, the real d dilemma is, are the, the elites of the origin countries willing to bring out the reforms that would lead to a development-friendly climate? And often this isn't the case. I won't go into examples now. Governments and international agencies want to fit mi migrants into neat bureaucratic categories, hence this desire to uh, decide whether people are fleeing in needs of protection or whether they want to build better lives. The reality is often that people want both, and that's why we see more and more the issue of mixed flows, which makes it very hard for agencies like UNHCR, which has a very restricted mandate um, to know how to react to these flows. So to come back to my original question, um, is the rapid growth of migration in 2015 merely a passing phenomenon or a new normal, not just for Europe, but for the world as a whole? And I think the answer has to be um, the factors that lead to increased migration and migration crises are going to remain active. Now, that doesn't mean that we will see crises of the same type as the ones of 2014 and 15. They may well take new forms. There may be well, well be periods in which um, such developments are less obvious. But the, the intrinsic pressures that we are building into the global system through increased inequality and decreased um, human security will continue and will probably intensify. So I think what we are seeing is the idea that the, the old approach to controlling migration, to trying to differentiate forms of migration, will no longer be very effective. And we have to see what we as migration scholars can do to broaden understanding of these fundamental changes that are taking place. Um, I, I take up uh, um, a, a concept of Eric Olin Wright here, the idea of building a real utopia, it, which means you cannot bring about fundamental change um, easily because there are so many entrenched interests against change. And what we can try and do is build up, um, if you like, islands of, of difference to show where things can be done differently. We can work together with non-governmental organisations, um, and I'm thinking very much there of the People's Global Action uh, on Migration development and human rights. Uh, we, can build, we can put our work in the service of such organizations which work at the grassroots level for change. Or we can, of course, decide not to do that and to persist in a purely academic agenda. And I, I would say it's very important for migration scholars to see what their possi possi possible role in building a new consciousness and a new way of doing things could be. Um, so in the end, what we should be struggling for is the recognition of human rights for all. And human rights include both the right to migrate and the right not to migrate, which is often you know, not there because people are forced to migrate by the conditions which they experience. So I'll stop there. Just, just this final slide is, it's a, it's a very poor picture, but it's an aerial view.
of one of the biggest refugee camps. Thank you, Steve. Let me start by saying uh, thanks to uh, Hein and Oliver for inviting me back to IMI, uh, especially on this auspicious occasion of the, uh, the 10th anniversary. Um, I'll get on quickly with the presentation. Let me just say one thing, which is that I, while I, I completely agree with what uh, Hein says about uh, a focus on sort of south-south migration and so on, what I'm going to say is very Eurocentric, and it's driven by, as many of us I, I think are aware of, the recent uh, uh, migration asylum crisis in Europe. So let me, um, and what I want to do is to do four things, look at some uh, time series, uh, look at some drivers of migration, think about public opinion and, in Europe and then come to some suggestions about how policy should evolve because I think this is a really important issue given the crisis that we're facing. Um, we've seen all this, 60 million displaced people as at the end of 2014 and here's what the uh, uh, UNHCR, uh, the High Commissioner um, Antonio Guterres has, the outgoing High Commissioner has had to say, it's a paradigm change and uh, it's different from anything we've seen before. And I think that's an interesting question because I'm not sure how much it is a, a, a paradigm change. As uh, Stephen has uh, shown, it was 60 million and that number is up from 37.5 million a decade ago, it was 51.2 million the end of 2013. But it's worth uh, um, uh, emphasizing that most of these people are in fact um, uh, internally displaced and not uh, what we think of as international migrants or refugees. So let me move to that uh, first of all because um, if we look at the number of refugees as defined by the uh, 1951 convention, uh, the trends look a bit different and actually the number uh, as of uh, 2014 is 13.7 million as compared with 17.8 million at the end of 1992, the last big surge in uh, the total stock of refugees. That's a stock, of course, not, a, not an annual flow. Um, that number is actually a bit different from the one uh, Stephen showed, basically because it doesn't include the Palestinians, which are under a separate uh, mandate, and that would add about 5 million onto the total. Um, if we just uh, skip forward here, you can see here's a graph of the uh, total stock of refugees, stock as defined in the 51 Convention, that's the blue line here, and the scale is on the left-hand side here, that's in uh, millions, and you can see a uh, peak in the early 90s, a gradual decline, and then a very sharp upturn in the last couple of years, which we all know <coughs> is due to the recent crisis. And that's compared with the red line, which is the number of asylum applications to 38 developed countries. This is what the UNHCR calls industrialized countries. And um, so it's basically the OECD. It's mo mostly Europe, uh, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Japan, Korea. That's basically the, the set of countries. And you can see, again, there's a big peak here in the 90, early 90s, a gradual f uh, decline with a blip in the, around 2002, then another fall and a big uh, upward shift, massive upward shift, uh, up to 2014, which is the last number on the graph. If we had 2015 there, that would go way off the graph completely. That's going to be, as, uh, as Stephen was saying, uh, a much, much larger uh, number. Okay, so these recent trends, I mean, partly reflect the uh, upward shift in the courses, causes of displacement, but they may uh, reflect a permanently higher level, as was the case in the, as we saw in the period leading up to 1992. And um, uh, some previous work I've done suggests that that was a shift to a permanently higher level. And I think the jury is out as to whether or not this recent surge that we've seen is also going to be a, a, a new plateau, so to speak. These recent events, as you will know as well as I do, possibly better than me, have sparked uh, political and policy uh, backlash. And they've in particular reignited the debate, debate, and this is a point that Stephen was emphasizing, about uh, uh, genuine refugees versus economic migrants. And, you know, we're, we're sort of, uh, we, we, we understand that there's mixed uh, migration uh, in all this, 
And you can see that in the, in, 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 in the data. On the one hand, most of the refugees that, or migrants that we're thinking of come from a, a list of strife-prone, poor countries. On the other hand, if you look at what happens in Europe and in North America and elsewhere, more than half of these applicants are rejected as uh, not being genuine refugees according to the uh, definition in the, in the 51 Convention. So let's first of all think about what causes these uh, surges in applications to uh, asylum applications to uh, the developed world. I'm going to briefly uh, outline uh, some research I've done and been doing over many years, actually, uh, looking at some regression analysis where we've got 19 uh, developed countries. These are the ones that are receiving the vast majority of all the asylum applications that I've showed you just now the red line, from 48 strife-prone origin countries, poor countries typically uh, often engulfed in wars and uh, uh, strife of one sort or another. And then the third dimension is, this is annual data from 1997 up to 2012. And these are regressions with dyad fixed effects in that I'm not going to sort of go into all the details. Let me just tell you briefly what the results are, though, because I think they're uh, intuitively uh, sort of uh, obvious. One is that the most important thing is war, terror, and human rights abuse. And these is, this is captured by a couple of variables. The political terror scale is the most important one, but the other one is uh, freedom the Freedom House Index of Civil Liberties. Both of those things uh, come in particularly importantly. Actually, war itself matters less, I think, because it's being captured by the other variables, particularly um, uh, human rights abuse. Uh, if you look at other origin country variables, uh, what I find in this analysis is that uh, origin country GDP per capita, living standards or average incomes, in other words, uh, is negatively related to application. So that means that if, if income were to go up in these countries, and this is partly because of the fact that they, these countries are embroiled in strife of one sort or another, um, but if income were to go up in these countries by 10%, then the number of asylum applications would go down by 5%. That's roughly what it means. Uh, now I'm just going to skip over the actual, because I don't really have time for that. Um, I can come back to it if anyone's interested. Um, Another thing, a third thing that really matters is destination country conditions, uh, particularly um, asylum policies. And what I've done, and I've been developing this over the years, is to develop a 15-component uh, index of asylum policy. And those 15 components can be uh, disaggregated into three groups of five components, the first of which uh, is policies aimed at limiting access to the country's territory, as you probably know. Effectively, in order to claim asylum in uh, the, the developed countries of Europe or North America uh, or Australia, you have to get onto the territory. Um, it's no longer possible to apply at uh, uh, embassies or high commissions in the origin country. Um, so this... Um, index is, uh, is, 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 tries to capture elements of uh, you know, border control and carrier sanctions, visa restrictions, all the things that try and uh, uh, limit people's access to the territory. And that does have quite strong deterrent effects. In other words, if you tighten your uh, access policies, then fewer people will apply for asylum in your country. It's not all that surprising, really, I think. Secondly, there are the set of, or the cluster, if you like, of policies that determine what happens to you once you've applied for asylum and how your asylum application uh, proceeds. Uh, if, where, how narrow is the definition of a refugee which is being applied? Uh, how, what, to what extent are, um, are applications uh, designated as manifestly unfounded and therefore the presumption is you don't get uh, refugee status? How quickly is that process undertaken? What is the appeals process and so on? So those are, that's another sort of cluster of, 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 of uh, uh, policies. That also has strong deterrent effects. The more you tighten up, the more you restrict those policies uh, against uh, asylum applicants, the fewer people will apply to your country. Thirdly, there's another set of things, which is 
what I'm loosely calling welfare policies, and these are things like, do you have access to benefits? Are you able to get uh, access to employment relatively quickly? Um, are you going to be put in detention? Are you dis dispersed into various parts of the country and so on? Those, I find, don't have any effect. And my interpretation of all this is that really what's driving people who apply for asylum is the, uh, the, the, the chance of gaining permanent settlement in the country to, to, to which they apply. We know from the, some of the pictures that Stephen's shown us that people will go through unbelievable hardship in order to achieve that. And so those uh, don't matter very much. Here's what the total policy index looks like, uh, adding all those, three, all those components up. There's a sharp tightening of policy uh, up until the mid-2000s, and then it's been relatively flat after that. The sharp tightening follows the 9-11 um, the, uh, attacks, for example, and the surge of, of applications that you saw around the early 2000s. And then after that, it's been, a bit, it's been much flatter, and partly, I think, because of the European um, uh, asylum policies that have been adopted at EU level the common European asylum system. Okay, so that's, uh, that's just what I've more or less said. So the CEES has been important. I want to move on now to looking at public opinion because when we think about reactions to this crisis, we've got to think about what uh, public opinion says because that's what's driving or at least constraining policymakers across Europe and elsewhere, but particularly in this focus, uh, across uh, Europe is what I'm looking at. And um, we've seen across European countries growth in uh, the support for far-right populist parties with strong anti-immigration agendas and platforms. And um, even if they're not actually power-sharing or uh, you know, part of the, the government, uh, they have huge influence on the policies adopted by mainstream centrist parties. And actually there's a large literature which you may be familiar with of uh, analysis of uh, public opinion towards immigration and uh, most of that's a sort of cross-sectional analysis looking, ac looking across d individuals within a country at a point in time, sometimes across different countries as well. Uh, that whole literature is an important one which has been developing the last 10 or 15 years. It, on the whole it t doesn't tell us anything about trends over time. It's a cross-sectional literature, very large. And I've been looking more recently at uh, how things change over time. In particular, uh, looking at the European Social Survey, the ESS. And in 2002, there was a separate module on uh, attitudes to uh, immigration. And that was repeated in 2014, unfortunately, with a different set of questions. A few questions are the same, and uh, that's a good thing, but um, uh, I wish more of them uh, were followed in that way. Here are the three questions I want to focus on just for a, a minute or two. Uh, one is about people of different race or ethnic group. Um, to what extent should your country allow those people in? Uh, the second one is about uh, poor countries outside Europe. To what extent should the country uh, uh, allow people, those people to come and live in the country concerned? And thirdly, and what I'm sort of perhaps most interested in, the government should be generous in judging applications for refugee status. And you, know, you can see there's a range of, 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 of uh, possible uh, uh, answers to those questions. Here's what they look like between uh, 2002 and 2014. What these, this table does, it gives you the 2014 um, uh, measure of the percentage, for example, who say few or none. So this is a measure of anti-immigration sentiment. Um, few or none should be allowed or would disagree with the idea of being generous to refugees. And you can see that what I've given you in the first column is the 2014 value, and then in the second column, the change since 2002. And what you can see, I, look at all the numbers if you like, but just looking at the bottom line, which is the, just the average of the 14 countries in the table, you can see that the attitudes towards um, different ethnic groups has uh, moderated a little bit, it's become more, uh, less anti-immigration. 
attitudes towards uh, people from poor countries has become a little bit uh, more anti-immigration, on average, 4%, you can see. Being generous to refugees has become um, more positive. That, that negative number means the number that anti-immigration attitudes have declined between 2002 and 2014 in almost all countries by quite a bit. So we've become more positive towards uh, refugees despite the fact that in other dimensions, ethnic groups and uh, people from poor countries, there hasn't been such a big change in opinion. If you correlate those changes over time, so that's just correlating the, the columns, 14 observations, you can see that the correlation of changes is very strong between the two groups of migrants that we, we were thinking about earlier. But between them and the uh, attitudes towards refugees, the, pot, the correlation is much less. So opinion on refugees is not as closely linked to these other two groups as you might uh, otherwise think. Um, it's possible that uh, these views have been shaped by our experience over time, the experience which I've shown you in the graphs of, of uh, surges in applications uh, uh, for asylum and so on. So what I've done here is to correlate change, the change in opinion between 2002 and 2012 with the change in asylum applications per capita over that period five years before uh, in each case. If you look at the asylum flows and you correlate that with um, eth ethnic group opinion, you can see that there's a positive correlation and it's you know, moderately large. Again, if you do the same thing for attitudes uh, towards immigrants from poor countries, you can see again it's positive and moderately large. If you do it with uh, being the, with with the opinion on being generous to refugees, you can see it's negative. So we've become more uh, friendly towards <coughs> refugees as the numbers have increased. That's not true of the other two uh, uh, components of opinion. Okay, so and I think that, that so that I'm offering that as background to um, to thinking about policy. Uh, most observers agree that. Uh, the flow of asylum applicants is a mixed migration um, and the effect of origin country income on uh, applications is consistent. With that. There are economic drivers and there are drivers which reflect conflict and human rights abuse. Public opinion has become more favorable to genuine refugees but mass is massively against illegal immigration. I didn't show you that. All the surveys say that people are massively against illegal immigration, and that's uh, been a constant for quite a long time. Okay, so if a backlash, if I think if we're going to avoid a backlash uh, against it uh, in, in this respect, then we, what we want to do is to, is to increase the capacity to host refugees, carrying people's support with us. That would apply, imply, I think, screening refugees before they reach uh, the uh, European shores in, in leaky boats and so on. So let me just then turn to, I'll come back to that point in, uh, a bit later on, uh, let me just turn to the common European asylum system. That's gone through three phases and the, the phases that it's gone through since 1999 have uh, mainly involved harmonizing standards across different European countries. But as we know, uh, asylum seeker preferences differ a lot between countries and it's very, very unbalanced. What the common asylum system means is that uh, countries uh, which are very popular can't have tougher asylum policies to bring the numbers down to equalize them across European countries. Uh, my earlier work suggests that, um, that this has led to some divergence. That's what it looks like. Uh, huge imbalance across European countries, and you're probably familiar with that. Um, I won't dwell on it um, too much. If we do care about refugees, and I think we definitely do, and the public opinion seems to suggest that, then we care about refugees, not just those that are in our own country, but those that are being looked after in other countries or helped in other regions. And that, one way we can think about that is 
in economic terms, is as a public good. Now, the theory of public goods tells us that uh, it, when um, public goods are supplied locally at a cost, then they will be underprovided because we don't take account of the benefit from, uh, that our citizens get from the fact that refugees are being looked, at, looked after in other countries. And that's the rationale for having a completely integrated um, common policy among European countries and perhaps in the wider world as well. So what that implies is if you're going to have harmonized policies, then, and you want to equalize these burdens, you must have some form of burden sharing. And that's where the uh, EU has fallen short. In recent, just, just last year, we had uh, a uh, agreement, quotes agreement, because not, not everybody agrees. It's not surprising. There's an incentive to free ride if you're uh, supplying public uh, goods. Um, but there was an agreement over 120,000, uh, redistributing 120,000 refugees. It's not many, but it is a start. So in order to build on that, I think we need to, uh, to radically increase refugee hosting capacity, we must cede policy to a supranational body, and that is obviously in the case of Europe, the EU, and treat the EU as a social planet. Would public opinion wear that uh, um, policy? We don't have much evidence specifically on asylum, but uh, there's astonishingly high support by EU citizens for a common policy on migration and asylum. Uh, for example, the Eurobarometer of 2015 suggested that uh, across, this is the average of countries, uh, over 70% would say, would support the idea of a uh, common European policy on migration. So there is some uh, support for public opinion uh, in, in, for, a, for a, a, a more integrated policy. So here are the implications, I think, for developed countries generally and specifically for the EU. Number one, making life miserable for asylum seekers when they apply for asylum uh, is not a deterrent, so let's not do it and put more resources into refugee welfare. Secondly, pushing money into uh, developing countries, uh, those either either uh, uh, creating refugees or transit countries won't stop people coming. 1.8 billion euros is a small drop in a very, very large bucket, so that's not going to work. Tougher border controls will work, and the Australian example, uh, I think, illustrates that. It doesn't work perfectly. Uh, it's very hard to do, um, but the evidence suggests from regression analysis I showed you earlier that it does deter asylum applications. We really ought to stop uh, to, 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 to get rid of the incentive for people to get on boats where 3,000 people have, have drowned in the Mediterranean in, in the Aegean last year. The, the way to do that is not to rescue people. It is to, is, it is to completely uh, reduce the incentive for people to get into boats in the first place. Public opinion is generally favorable to genuine refugees and not to, to others who attempt the boat trip and come as illegal immigrants. So one thing about stronger border controls is it would help gain public confidence in asylum and migration systems. But it would screen out genuine refugees, and that's a problem. So what can we do about that? First of all, I would say... Uh, provide much more support for refugees in transit countries, embark on a major resettlement scheme, uh, then you will target asylum policies on people who are most in need of help, our help uh, and, and, and political protection, not just those who are brave enough, rich enough, uh, energetic enough to get on boats and risk their lives in the Mediterranean or the Aegean. If we do care about referee, uh, refugees and uh, we view them as a um, uh, locally provided public good, then, um, then we, we can do that by having a much more integrated European policy to uh, promote a, a Europe-wide um, 
uh, resettlement scheme. So here's the conclusion. There are no easy solutions to this. I think everybody knows that by now. Uh, this, this issue has preoccupied Europe for the last three years, but we could do better. We could tighten the borders more. I think that's essential to stop people drowning at sea and to ensure that we maintain public support for uh, asylum and refugee policies. And we target our efforts on those most in need. But and the important point I think I would emphasize is any policy that you, pro that you propose needs to be feasible. It needs, we, we, we need to have measures that will work with the grain of public opinion and not against it. Otherwise, we're going to have a massive backlash, and you can see that already happening in some European countries, which I won't mention. This, is, I think, is a constructive way of developing EU asylum policy, but let's be, let's be, be, be honest about it. This is only going to go a small way toward alleviating the hardships and miseries of 60 million people. Thank you.